health misinformation is an epidemic. And it's really unfortunate because we're in this era of information where you can get anything you want on the internet in 10 seconds. It's really important to me that people are provided with the tools to make informed decisions about their health. Because at the end of the day, your health is, it's all you've got. And finally, after day six, after not having slept for three days, because I was up all night for three days straight, I decided to go to urgent care. And I fully expected them to be like, that's nice. Go have some Rolaids, you'll be fine. No, I was septic and I had a, a mass the size of a tennis ball on my colon. And they, you know, I had to go for surgery the next morning and they cut me down my midline. I have a six inch scar down my belly button and they removed a third of my colon and I have this huge scar and I love it because it's a reminder of the fact that it's your responsibility to take care of your body and every day is not guaranteed. I mean You're listening to the Light Edge Podcast, the place to learn, grow, and succeed. Heather, thank you for joining us today on the Life Edge podcast. Why don't you go ahead, take a brief moment, tell us a little bit about yourself and what it is that you offer. Well, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here and um, talk a little bit about Planify. So I own Planify Nutrition and Wellness, and it is a nutrition coaching business that I established to support joyful plant-based women on a journey to achieving their best self. And when I say joyful plant-based women, I'm not specifically working only with women who identify as vegetarian or vegan. In fact, most of the women I work with are omnivorous and are more plant-based curious or just more open to incorporating more plants into their life because they understand the benefit and the value of doing so. So my business is um, focused on nutrition coaching, but it's really value driven. And a lot of what I do is help women to align their values with their goals and their actions specifically related to their dietary choices. I love that because it sounds very personalized <laughs> and it's not just, I'm going to shove this nutrition plan down your throat. Yeah. So I offer these one-on-one -on -one coaching programs, and I also offer a couple of other things too, but the the one-on-one -on -one coaching programs are so personalized, and I put a lot of time and effort into them, and it's not just designing like your macro or your calorie count. It's really getting to know clients and understanding what really motivates them and what drives them, helping to understand their values, their motivations for doing so, because that helps me help them. Because if I don't understand what drives you, it's difficult for me to really motivate you in a way that's actually going to be sustainable. My goal is never to say, like, you need to change the way you eat because it's going to prevent disease. It's going to be, so why are you making these changes? Oh, you want to keep up with your kids. So in order for you to keep up with your children, one of your goals is to eliminate some of the knee pain that you're experiencing because you're carrying a few extra pounds than you're comfortable with. So let's really figure out how to improve that situation. What foods do you like to eat? What are you interested in? Okay, great. Let's figure out how to incorporate those. So I really focus on individual needs, individual preferences, and nothing is boilerplate except for the basic plan that I put women on, which is a standard 12-week curriculum that is just the backbone of all the um, custom nutrition coaching that I provide. Oh, that's great. Before we dive too much more into the nutrition, will you just give us a little bit about your background and where your, your knowledge base comes from regarding nutrition? Yeah, I would love to. So I have a really varied background, and I'm quite certain that I am probably like one of five people in the world who have the same background. So um, I, I'll start from the beginning. I am first and foremost a medical librarian. 
So I have a master's degree in library and information studies, and I worked for several years at Dartmouth College at the medical school and at the um, academic medical center. And I worked in the hospital and worked a lot with doctors and medical students and public health students to help them make evidence-based decisions for patients. So for example, if a doctor came in, they might say, I have a patient coming in and they've been having these really strange symptoms, but none of the treatments that I've recommended have worked. Can you help me find something that will be effective for them? So I would help with that. I'd also work really intensely with patients to help them to um, make informed decisions. So for example, they were recently diagnosed with something and there are five different options to make them well. I would help them identify all of those options and understand those options so that they could make evidence-based informed decisions. And then I also have a degree in infectious disease, which is, I love it. It is, I, I want to say that it's something that I had been wanting to do since high school, but I got to it second, right? The um, master's in library science was first, and then I tried to ignore this yearning to have a degree in infectious disease, but I couldn't ignore it, and I finally got on board, and I love it. I'm obsessed with infectious disease. It's so fun. <laughs> um, and in that program, I focused a lot on neglected tropical diseases, but we also focused on the role of nutrition and infection. Mm. And that was just, I loved it. It was so like stimulating, and it just made so much sense that if you are not nutritionally replete, then you are more susceptible to infection. And if you weren't eating properly while you had an infection, you were not able to get over that infection. And then if you had an infection, you were more susceptible to more infection. And it just became this perpetuating cycle with nutrition at the center. And then of course, if you're chronically ill, then there are these host of other factors that affect you, like reduced access to employment or disability. So I could go on for hours about that because <laughs> I, oh my gosh, infectious disease. I just love it. And then that led to this desire to get a certification in nutrition coaching. So it's all tied together. So that's why everything that I do is evidence-based because I'm trained as a medical librarian to find that highest quality of evidence and then interpret it. Can you explain what nutrition replete is? Because I don't know. Oh, I've never heard that phrase. Yeah, absolutely. So nutritionally replete just means that you have all the nutrients that you need to function at optimal performance. So I guess it's the, op um, the opposite of having mm. a nutritional deficiency or insufficiency. Now, just kind of based on what you said, I'm going out on a limb here, but I'm deferring a little bit that you think that nutrition is a big part of a healthy human and staying healthy? Yes. So I think that nutrition is not, it's sometimes overlooked as an important factor in our lives. So our bodies require micronutrients. So not just your macros, not just your protein, your carbs and your, your fat, but these micronutrients, your vitamins and your minerals to, to function. So every biochemical process relies on these micronutrients. So calcium, for example, that's involved in muscle contraction and nerve conduction. And we're not thinking about that. We're thinking, oh, calcium, it's good for strong bones. I'm fine. My bones are strong. Who cares about calcium but it's so important for so many physiological and biochemical functions it's it's so interesting to watch you talk about this and for anyone listening when she's talking about calcium like her face is lighting up there's this giant <laughs> smile like you truly do enjoy nutrition and the micronutrients nutrients and how they affect the body and it's this isn't just a Oh, I'm talking to somebody who just wanted to get a nutrition license because or certification for a money grab. Like you truly want to help people. Oh, I love it. And like vitamin A, for example, it's called the 
anti-infection vitamin and I know that vitamin C gets all the love for um, like fighting infection, but vitamin A is where it's at and I just want to promote like everything I can about the role of these nutrients that just get often overlooked for their role mm. in the immune system. This is this is great because it, it it's exciting when somebody when you can tell somebody is truly passionate about passionate <laughs> about what they're doing. And so I'm really excited for this to to continue this conversation. Let's dive into a bit of the nutrition. Um, I think we've covered a little bit about your background. But why, why some of the more plant-based direction and then why, why – I guess we covered the why in nutrition is because you feel that it's kind of the foundation for everything. So I guess mm -hmm. more why the, why the philosophy that you've chosen. Uh, well, thank you for asking. So I myself am a plant-based person and I had previously worked with a nutrition coach and um, – they were also a plant-based person. And I was really excited about that because I have worked with other people in the nutrition space and it can be quite uncomfortable working with someone who doesn't really understand your dietary preferences or your lifestyle. And they encourage you, oh, you know, you should eat meat or, you know, you should try this. You should really incorporate fish. It's really healthy. and. As someone who is pretty set on being plant-based, I'm, I'm not going to take that advice because I know it works for me and I know it aligns with my preferences and my ethical beliefs and my lifestyle. So I wanted to start my own business and really cater to people who are similar to me and are looking for someone who really understands where they're at. Now. My business is primarily for plant-based women, but like I said previously, most people I work with are not plant-based, although I will say that plant-based is a spectrum. So it ranges from flexitarian all the way down to raw vegan. So if you're someone who mostly eats vegetarian, but you, you know, eat fish or you eat beef or whatever occasionally, you're still plant-based if the majority of your, your meals are centered around plants. So that being said, whenever I work with someone who's not a vegetarian or not a vegan, um, I never tell them to stop eating meat or to really change anything about their um, dietary preferences or choices except to, hey, maybe you should, you know, try tofu. You don't have to eat it all the time. You don't have to eat it instead of your beef, but just try it. You might like it. If you don't, that's fine. We'll never talk about it again. Also, maybe you should eat more vegetables. It's, it, I, I never try to impose my values or my ethics on another person. We're just always making guided, informed, evidence-based decisions that align with their values. And there is a lot of evidence out there to indicate that plant-based diets do actually support longevity and do support um, improved outcomes as related to chronic disease or the development of disease. Um, but I will say that a lot of those studies are based on observational studies. So it's hard for me to sit here and say that um, plant-based diets cause better outcomes or they cause longevity they're associated with. So that's my hedge <laughs> as an evidence-based person who is really obsessed with the evidence and understanding how to interpret it. So um, if you're listening and you're interested in anything that I'm saying or any of my services, know that I will never try to impose my ethics or values on you. Everything is really just centered and personalized on your experiences and values. Mm. And it's, it's so refreshing to hear because health is very like – not medicine, we're stepping into like health is very mm -hmm. personalized and it needs Absolutely. to be personalized because even, even when it comes down to plants in general, some people may digest something better than they do someone else. And for another person, it may be vice versa. And so I really enjoy the personalized approach 
to we're going to work specifically with what you got. And you keep you keep saying evidence based. Would you dive a little bit more into that and and what evidence you're looking at and then how you interpret that? Yeah, absolutely. So evidence based practice in medicine and I'm not practicing medicine, but this definition draws from the definition of evidence based medicine. It is informed by the highest quality of medical and scientific literature that is published, preferences, and experience of the practitioner. So when I say evidence-based medicine or practice, I'm looking at those three components. So what does the literature say? What do I know to be essentially true based on my experience? And what is going to work for you? So that component about the literature, what I'm thinking, what I'm thinking about is when a researcher, whether that's a PhD or um, someone with a degree in public health or a physician is conducting research, whether that is um, an observational study where you're just looking at outcomes either prospectively or in the rear view mirror, or you're conducting a randomized controlled trial, and I apologize if I'm getting too into the weeds, um, they're going to publish that evidence mm -hmm. and in a paper. And I'm going to look at that paper and see what the evidence says. So sometimes we see evidence that is pulled out by um, journalists and they publish the sexy headlines without a whole lot of context. So for example, um, we hear a lot about the role of intermittent fasting in the development of Alzheimer's disease. And that is such a hot topic. But when you look at the evidence, most of those studies were conducted in rats or mice. So does that mean that intermittent fasting is associated with, does it, so does that mean that intermittent fasting has a protective effect against Alzheimer's? Well, in rats and mice, yes, but not necessarily in humans. But does that mean that we shouldn't recommend intermittent fasting for people who want to curb their development of Alzheimer's disease? Not necessarily. So if someone's really interested in trying that, sure, let's try it. But just know that there's not a whole lot of evidence to support the fact that it works. On the other hand, there's not a whole lot of evidence to say, no, it doesn't work in humans. So I'm always trying to balance recommendations with preferences and what the scientific literature says. Mm -hmm. Real quick, I would kind of want to go down this rabbit hole because this is your specialty and you're so excited about it. Um, and it, it seems like there's, when it comes to nutrition and health specifically, the waters have just been muddied as far as accurate information. So how does one go through sifting through to figure out what's accurate and what's not when something says, well, based on this study, we proved that cheese is the ultimate cure to cancer. And it's like, okay, how, how do I argue that? And then I go look up the study and the study doesn't make sense to me because it's in these big words and I'm not a medical student. And how does one like person like me figure out how to determine what is correct and what isn't? Very good question. So first of all, health misinformation is everywhere and it is prolific. And I get on Instagram and I try to be super balanced and kind, but every so often I have to put on my vigilante hat because someone has posted gross health misinformation and it's gotten like 62,000 likes. And health misinformation is an epidemic. And it's really unfortunate because we're in this era of information where you can get anything you want on the internet in 10 seconds. And with social media, things get shared so rapidly. And then there's this algorithm that pushes out information that gets more likes and more views. And if that information happens to be misinformation, it's reaching more viewers than anything I'm putting out reaches. So everything I put out 
it, it's not getting 60,000 likes. It's not even getting 600 views, for example. So it's hard for someone like me to compete with that algorithm mm -hmm. and that it makes it really difficult for people to, to know what they should be trusting and what they should be reading and where should they should be getting their health information. So if there's someone who is looking for quality information, I would suggest a few different websites. So the Mayo Clinic, they have very high standards for what they, they post on their website. Harvard Medical School also has very high standards and they have a, a school of public health. So they also dive into um, different issues that maybe the Mayo Clinic doesn't. Cleveland Clinic, also awesome website. And then there's the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. And that's a product of the National Institutes of Health. They also have good information on like supplements and like adaptogenic herbs, for example. So those are websites that I always recommend. And when it comes to websites that I don't recommend, um, most of them, honestly, <laughs> and a lot of... <laughs> A lot of that reason is that the people who write these articles are not qualified to write them. So it's really important to look at the credentials of the people who are writing these articles and really ask yourself, is this person qualified to write this article? What's their background? What's their motivation for writing this article? What's the website's motivation for publishing this article? Is, is this a clickbait article? Is the is the page littered with ads? If it is, like that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's there are just certain things that you know you should be on the lookout for. So several years ago, um, when Prince died, I was working with a medical student who had cited WebMD in one of their presentations, and I was like, no, 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 we can't can't do that. So, but show me where you found this. So they went on WebMD and on the front page of WebMD is like, Prince is dead. And I'm like, why? That's not medical information, but it was a way that they were able to get more clicks to their site. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, the, the information on WebMD is not necessarily misinformation. They're just better sources of information, health information to out there. Um, and like I said, Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, Harvard Med School, um, NIH websites. Also, there's Medline Plus, which is also a product of the National Library of Medicine. And you can type in virtually any health condition into that website, and it will bring up articles that are written for people, like everyday people. And it's written in an accessible way, but it's scientifically sound. So um, the Medline Plus, everything on there is vetted and most of the information comes from different government sources, but they also do pull from the Mayo Clinic. So I like to think of Medline Plus as like the Google of health information, but everything is high quality. That's, that's good to know because I know for a fact in my lifetime, Eggs have been terrible and then good for you and then terrible for you. Like if you eat eggs, you're going to die. And then if you don't eat eggs, you're going to die. And that's yeah. been like, that's gone back and forth probably like five or six times since I've been alive. Yeah. And how do you then, someone who thinks very analytically, how do I then trust anyone at that point? If wait, eight years ago, you said eggs were bad for me. Now over here, you're saying eggs are good for me, but you were the same person saying eggs are bad. It, it just gets, everything gets very muddy down and nutrition. I, I agree. I think nutrition is extremely important and I want good information, but it's just been hard to come by in the noise that has become the internet lately. Yeah. And you know, you bring up a really good point. So you, you said something that really struck me. So, you know, one year you hear that eggs are bad and then the same group that published that article five years later they publish an article saying that eggs are good so it's really important to note that medicine and health it's the conclusions that we base are based on the best available evidence at the time mm. so it may be that there are some articles published 
and they're based on lower quality evidence studies. And they say eggs are good, but then when they continue to follow that group of individuals for 15 years more, maybe they find out that, hey, maybe those who ate eggs are had a higher incidence of heart disease. For example, I'm not necessarily saying that's true at all. But also when we look at those studies, there are other things that we have to look into, such as the study design. So a lot of these are based on observational studies. And in those studies, it's difficult to really control. So in an observational study, the person who's observing a, a group, which is a cohort, and they're usually you know, several hundred thousand people, they don't have any control over the exposures of that group. So by the exposures, I mean like the, those who ate eggs, those who smoked cigarettes, those who drank soda. The researcher has no control. The only research studies in which the researcher has control are the randomized control trials in which they say, you're going to eat eggs for five years. You're not going to eat eggs for five years. And then we're going to compare those two groups. And in those studies, you can draw conclusions um, but when you have an observational study, it's really hard to infer causality. All you can say is there is an association. So there are all these different factors, but when it comes to nutrition, all I can say is that most things in moderation are probably okay. So there was recently a study published to say that avocados were associated with increased incidence of breast cancer among women. And this actually ties in perfectly to what you were just saying. So the researchers found that avocados were associated with an increased risk of breast cancer among women and people freaked out. And they wondered, should I stop eating avocados? And for me, I'm not going to stop eating avocados. They are a nutrient powerhouse, but I'm probably not going to start eating more than I typically would because I enjoy them in moderation. But in that same study, they also found that another group of women did not develop breast cancer. And this was an observational study. And they also found that among men, there was a decreased risk of several cancers when it came to eating avocados. So these observational studies, a lot of times they, they demonstrate these associations and sometimes the strength of the association is really powerful and really strong. And sometimes you can say, you know what, the association is so strong that maybe we do make healthcare decisions, but when the association is somewhat tenuous, then we say, you know what, we still have a lot of work to be done, but because there is this potential link between this exposure, the food, and this outcome, the development of cancer or mortality, we, we're just going to keep an eye on it and maybe just enjoy things in moderation. Or if, if you personally want to cut this food out entirely because you think that you have an increased risk of this disease to begin with, go ahead and do that. But it's difficult to recommend making extreme changes based on observational studies for which there's not a very high strength of evidence. Thank you, because you, you verbalized a lot of what I was thinking and, and derived from other conversations with other um, very well-versed people when it comes to nutrition, but I think it's something that needs to be talked about more, because I don't think... I just don't think that there's enough conversation about it and too many people are too willing to just trust the headline and move on about life. And just because it, life is busy, right? So do mm -hmm. I have time to worry about uh, reading through this article and doing the actual research on whether or not avocados cause breast cancer? No, there's a head headline causality, uh, no more avocados. <laughs> it's like, well. Yeah. Yeah, so I love this stuff. So if someone came to me and they were like, can you help me understand whether or not this is true? Oh my gosh, you'd make my day. Because if there's any way that I can contribute to helping people make informed decisions about their health, I love it. 
But then also it's really important to know you talked about this headline. So a lot of times I see articles in the news and they report on information that is found in the abstract of an article. Hmm. And an abstract is typically a 250 word synopsis of the article. And it is not intended to be read on its own. It's intended to help you understand what the article is about so that you want to read the full article or you decide this isn't what I'm looking for. I don't need to read this whole article, Mm. but if you're going to make any sort of decision about your health, you have to read the article or come to me and I'll help you read the article. But there's so much to be gleaned from a full article. And one of the most important factors is the methods. Like who did they recruit? Who did they leave out? Um, If it was a a study evaluating the effect of a medication, did they use an ideal patient or did they use a patient that reflects the actual type of patient who's going to be using this, this medication? So there's so much to be gleaned and then that helps you understand whether or not the results of that study can actually be applied to you and that's known as generalizability. Mm-hmm. So these a lot of the like news outlets, I don't know if they're reading the whole study. Some of them do. Some outlets are really responsible and they do their due diligence. Others, I don't have any evidence to support this. So this is anecdotal and based on speculation, but I have a feeling that sometimes these articles are written based on the abstract. And in fact, I am in the process of writing a book and as part of about how to find good information. And as part of my research for that book, I purchased a book that will not be named because I do not think that it deserves the light of day. And this author went through and summarized a number of articles about vaccination. And I have a degree in infectious disease, so it's probably evident how I feel about vaccines. They save lives. If you don't want to get vaccinated, that's fine, but we don't have to talk about it. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But this author went in and he found all these studies on vaccines and they were all negative and they contain each summary contained two sentences about the study. And I looked up every single study and there was nothing in his summary that was not in the abstract. And I'm like, you, this is really irresponsible because mm-hmm. it's biased. Not, you didn't include anything that was positive. So the data were cherry picked and you don't know whether or not, This is a high quality study. Mm -hmm. So again, vigilante hat. I don't love to wear that hat, but I have to put it on sometimes because like I said, misinformation is an epidemic and it's really important to me that people are provided with the tools to make informed decisions about their health. Because at the end of the day, your health is, it's all you've got. You have one body you don't get a second one. I mean, yes, there are instances where you get an an organ transplant, but it's your responsibility to take care of the body that you've been given. Yeah. And I I can't agree more because I doubt there's a billionaire on plan on the planet who wouldn't give up everything they have for another day of life for another day, another week of life, just because like life is what matters. Your health is what matters and it's important. It is. And that ties perfectly back to how I approach working with clients and identifying their values and helping them to align those values with their goals and their you know, dietary choices. Mm-hmm. So let's dive into that a little bit. Um, I, this conversation has been great and I've learned a lot. I hope everybody else is learning a lot. Um, I really enjoyed uh, getting to speak with somebody who's so knowledgeable, but can also eloquently answer the the questions. So thank you again for that. But let's move into the nutrition aspect. And what are like five tips that you could leave the listener with? Oh, wow. So that's a really great question. So first of all, identify your values. Um, if you do not know what your values are right off the top of your head, 
um, there's a website called VIA Survey, and it's viasurvey.com. And I encourage all of my clients to take this survey. I think it's in week three of my one-on-one -on -one program. And it's really eye-opening because a lot of people, they, under, they think they know what their values are. But when you answer these questions and they tell you what your values are, it's really illuminating. So my number one value is love. And I was like, what the heck does that mean? And then I realized that everything I do is for my family. And that means staying healthy so that I can stay healthy for my family and enjoy more moments with them. So one, identify your values. B, set goals. Is your goal to maintain your level of fitness? Great. That's a great place to start. Um, so if your goal is to lower your blood pressure, to lose weight, to um, increase muscle mass, that's a great place to start. Number three, set goals. You want to set goals that are measurable, specific, and achievable, and also time limited. I went out of order. Typically, we say SMART goals. So specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. Beyond that, you want to also set process goals. So your performance goal, for example, may be to lose a pound a week or eat five servings of fruits and vegetables every day. Great. That's your performance goal. Process goal. What are you going to do to meet that goal this week? Sometimes we need to break things down because even if we don't meet that main goal, if we met some of our process goals, you still experience success and that's what's gonna keep you going, but it also helps to set you up. So we'll say the five fruits and vegetables. My goal is to eat five servings of fruits and vegetables every day. Process goals, make a list of the vegetables I wanna buy. Two, plan a couple of side dishes that contain those vegetables and eat all those vegetables, like eat all the, eat the entire side dish. Don't just let it sit in the fridge and, and go to waste. Number three, um, shop for those vegetables. Number four, as soon as you get home, chop those fruits and vegetables so that they're available for you to eat them. And then maybe your fifth goal is to prepackage some of those fruits and vegetables so that they're easy for you to grab for your lunch or when you're looking for a snack. And then number five, reflect. So every week I encourage my clients to um, reflect on their progress and think about what they need to be successful in the next week, who they need that support from. Um, and then also to think about all of the progress that they've made and to celebrate every success that they have had that week. So that success can be, hey, I ate five servings of fruits and vegetables, or you know what, I need help eating five servings of fruits and vegetables, but I actually made my list, I made my side dishes, I chopped them when I got home, I portioned everything out, so I, I met all of my process goals, but maybe I didn't buy enough. Maybe I didn't buy enough fruits and vegetables to get me through the week, so on days six and seven, I just had to eat what I had left and it didn't allow me to meet my goal. So then there's also that planning component. The process of writing your goals and reflecting is so powerful and has been so well received by clients that I've worked with one-on-one. -on -one. I actually published that journal. So it's available on Amazon. It's called 12 Steps to an Empowered Weight Management Journey. And it's not intended to be only used alongside my program. It can be used independently um, in conjunction with any other program, but it basically it provides a brief introduction about how to set your goals, identify your values, talk to your friends and family about those values because a lot of times we find that people make these healthy changes and they end up feeling shamed by their friends and family because we're in a really amazing place as a society and that we're embracing body positivity and I think there's a lack of awareness as to why some people are making healthy changes. And it's not necessarily just because people want to go down a size and um, feel more confident in a bathing suit. That could be why you're choosing to make changes and that's okay. 
Um, other reasons could be wanting to keep up with loved ones or um, a spouse or family members or get back to playing soccer after an interregnum. So the first part of that book, it's very brief, that part. Um, it's just about having those conversations and getting your friends and family on board so you feel supported. Mm -hmm. And then the second half, that's where you have all those goal setting activities and all of those reflection activities. So again, that's on Amazon. It's called 12 Weeks to an Empowered Weight Management Journey. That's that's great. And I'll make sure to actually include that down below in the, the show notes and in the description. So if you want to check out that journal, you can uh, you can just look down below in the in the description. Awesome. Um, Heather, I cannot say thank you enough for your time here today. And there's one question I love to ask all the guests as we start to wrap up, and that is, what is one lesson that you've learned throughout life, um, can be anything, that you want to make sure you leave with the listeners? Sure. So first of all, thank you for the time. It's been an absolute pleasure. And one thing that I've learned is to not take your health for granted and to listen to your body. And I am not just saying that because I am in the health industry, because I have been in medicine and science for my entire career. Um, I say that because four years ago, I had a very serious health scare. Mm -hmm. And I've always been a very health conscious person. And when I get sick, I'm like, I'm fine, I'm healthy, I know what to do, I don't get scared. I also have a tendency to be hard on myself and to power through things. So four years ago, I was experiencing, I won't go into the whole story, but I was experiencing severe abdominal pain. And I started experiencing this pain um, the day I was packing my kitchen to move. My husband was gone that day. He was traveling. There was a shooting next door that day. The person who shot the gun, threw the gun, scary. I have a nervous stomach, so me experiencing abdominal pain in the midst of stress, not unheard of for me. But I had this pain for six days. And finally after day six, after not having slept for three days, because I was up all night for three days straight, I decided to go to urgent care and I fully expected them to be like, that's nice. Go have some Rolaids. You'll be fine. No, I was septic and I had a, a mass the size of a tennis ball on my colon and they, you know, I had to go for surgery the next morning and they cut me down my midline. I have a six inch scar down my belly button and they removed a third of my colon and I have this huge scar and I love it because it's a reminder of the fact that it's your responsibility to take care of your body and every day is not guaranteed. I mean, like I said, I am healthy. I exercise, I eat well, I take care of myself, but life is not guaranteed. Your health is not guaranteed. So anything you can do to combat whatever nature is going to do for you in the first place is so important. So there are two ways to look at this. You can say, well, what's going to happen is what is what's going to happen. I may as well enjoy my life because who knows? But then the other way is what's going to happen is going to happen. But there are certain things that I can control and that's like modifiable um, life factors. But it's your responsibility to take control over what you have in order to maintain that health. And again, this goes back to values. If your value is being with your family, make changes for them, for you. One thing that I like to say is make changes because you love your body, not because you hate it. So again, we go back to the stigma that surrounds healthy eating, making healthy changes. People assume that you're making healthy changes because you hate your body. But on the other hand, no, you could be making those changes because you love your body and you respect it. So I think that was a long-winded way of saying, but I think it's an important part of, 
it's an important part of my story and um, part of my why for feeling so passionately about helping other people to achieve the highest quality of health they can. That was a very powerful story. And I appreciate you sharing that with us because I think everyone is now better off because you show the importance of staying healthy, but listening to your body and, and then embracing what's really important in life is life itself. And so there, there was so much in that. It wasn't just nutrition. It wasn't just health. It was everything. And so I appreciate you being vulnerable and just sharing that with us. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to share. Where can the listener go to connect with you, to learn more about your coaching, maybe join your program or to follow you on social media? Yeah. So thanks for asking. So my website is plantify.com, P-L-A-N-T-I-P-H-Y.com. It's sort of a play on um, like phytonutrients and <laughs> photosynthesis. So plantify with a P-H. Dot com and I am very active on Instagram at Plantify Nutrition, P L A N T I P H Y Nutrition, and um, I love posting reels with tips about how to live a healthier lifestyle. And it's also where you'll find the information about some one-on-one -on -one coaching, but also this challenge that I decided to launch. So I also just launched a 28-day challenge slash mini course. And it's a four week course and it's unlike my one-on-one -on -one programs and that you don't have to apply to work with me. I typically request that clients um, apply to work with me and interview with me before we go ahead and start a coaching relationship. That way we know it's a good fit for one another because nutrition is such an intimate personal journey. I want to make sure that you're comfortable with me and that you want to spend your next 12 weeks being vulnerable with me because it is, it's a very vulnerable experience making those changes. But with the challenge, um, I developed a like about 180 page ebook mm -hmm. with information on four key, key nutrients that are essential for women's health. And that gets delivered to you in four sections over four weeks. And all of that content is delivered via the Plantify app. And it's, there's a leaderboard in the app and there's an opportunity to win chat, um, prizes. There's also a community forum. So it's really, it's very different from what I normally offer, but I'm really excited about it because there's that community component and it's definitely less intensive. So it's looking at four key nutrients, learning more about the role of those nutrients in, your, in women's health specifically, um, identifying different food sources that have um, a high quantity of those nutrients, tracking them independently, and then just going into the app and saying, yep, I." you know, it was nutritionally replete today, and then you earn points and you can win giveaways and you have full access to me in the app. You can ask questions to me. You can ask questions in the group forum. Um, so it's a really great introduction to learning about the kind of um, coaching that you get from me, but there's also this cool community component that I think is really vital to, um, to experiencing success. So go ahead and find me on Instagram and you can sign up for that challenge. Like I said, registration does end June 25th, um, and that just gives me enough time to make sure that you're set up to be successful in the challenge. I don't want anyone to sign up on July 1st and then realize that they had a, a fair amount of planning to do to be successful, and then they've lost a few days, mm -hmm. for example, because they didn't have an opportunity to like buy some of the foods that are going to help them meet those goals. I love it. Um... I will make sure to include links to your website, but also include a direct link to the challenge for anyone that wants to sign up. So you can just jump right into that challenge. Um, and it sounds like there is a lot of value being added in what you're bringing and to bring in some giveaways and stuff on top of it. That's, that's really cool. I haven't heard many people doing giveaways in their challenge. So that's, that's a fun feature. Um, yeah, and it's super cheap. It's like just a dollar a day. So um, those course materials, they will go up to $49 after the challenge is over. So by joining that challenge, um, you'll have the benefit of the community aspects. And then you'll also have access to that um, the giveaways, for example. Um, but it is at a steep discount. It's sort of an introductory price. 
So if you want the materials, but you don't necessarily want to participate in the challenge, sign up anyway, and you can still get them at a reduced price. Heather, I can't say thank you enough. Um, there is so much more to talk about. I would love to have you as a guest um, <laughs> later as well when, when we get some more time because you are a wealth of knowledge and I, I really can tell that you enjoy what it is you're doing. You enjoy helping people. Like you said, your number one value is love and it really shows in how you communicate and it really shows in the knowledge base that you have and and how you're going about helping your clients. So I really appreciate your time today. I encourage everyone to go follow Heather um, at Plantify Nutrition on Instagram. Check out her website and sign up for her challenge. So thank you, Heather, and hope you have a great day. Thank you so much, Chris. It's been a pleasure.